Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is David and I'm a, a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania in the BioCiphers lab. And today I'll be sharing some of our work on um, improving statistical methodology for discovery and characterization of splicing associated variants. So allow me to begin by first introducing a fundamental question genomics that I'm sure we're all familiar with, which is how disease phenotypes and genetic variants are connected. And for the last you know, 20 years or so, since the advent of genome sequencing, uh, the main approach for uh, achieving this task has been the GWAS, where we take cohorts of patients and compute statistical associations between their genotypes and phenotypes. Now, while um, statistical associations um, are, are nice, um, but they don't necessarily tell us how a variant actually acts on a phenotype. And the field has turned to molecular QTLs, um, which are quantitative trait loci, uh, where a um, genetic variant is correlated with um, some molecular uh, measurement of interest, such as gene expression or alternative splicing. Um, and what we observe is that, well, if a, um, EQ, if, if a genetic ver EQTL co-localizes with a um, GWAS signal, um, this tends to only explain a small fraction of um, GWAS signals. And what was observed in the seminal paper late all 2016 was that um, many GWAS signals actually co-localize with SQTLs or um, genetic variants that are associated with splicing. So SQTLs here can be seen sort of as the missing piece of the puzzle or one of the main links um, between uh, genetic variants. Okay, so despite the importance of um, SQ, uh, despite the importance of um, SQTLs, the methods to detect and analyze them have not changed in uh, over a decade. And the GTEx consortia recently published a. Um, a study in 2020 where they um, basically tried to create an SQTL catalog. And what I'm showing on the screen here is um, the pipeline they used in this study. And what you see in red are basically all the steps in this pipeline where that are, were adapted directly as is from EQTL pipelines without any change. And the only thing they really, they, they, they really changed here was the input representation, which was a, a splicing quantification created by a method called leaf cutter which measures splicing as the ratio of um, exon, ex, uh, sorry, intron inclusion um, as determined by the, 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 the quanti quantity psi, which essentially looks at the junction spanning reads here in blue divided by the total number of junction spanning reads. And so this naturally leads to um, two questions, right? So first, um, is, this, is the application of this EQTL model to, uh, to splicing data fundamentally incorrect? And second, um, does this actually matter, right? So, you know, as, as the saying goes, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So here we really want to understand whether this um, actually matters or has any practical consequences. So to answer this question, uh, we begin with a case study on GTEx across five representative tissues to better understand the ramifications of using this pipeline. And we summarize some of our key observations uh, in four main lessons, which I'm about to share today. So first, it is important to understand that unlike with gene expression quantifications, splicing quantifications and representations are, are quite diverse. So while leaf cutter presents one view of splicing through the view of uh, intron excisions, uh, this view is actually very limiting, right? So here I present an alternative view of splicing, uh, which is developed uh, by the, 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 which is represented by the Magic method from our lab. And this represents splicing as local splice variations or LSVs which represent exon splicing decisions. And this approach um, is advantageous in that it allows us not only model um, classical events, in, in, which you see in red, and, and cassette exons, but also de novo events and intron retention. So intron retention here is shown in, in, in purple, which uh, allow us to observe splicing at a much higher resolution. So while leaf cutter is able to find um, classical and de novo events as well, as you can see in this table, um, the, the, the nature of the method, looking at splicing from the perspective of exon uh, in, intron excisions, makes it rather uninterpretable. Um, and um, so, so yeah, um, so it's uninterpretable. And then we can then augment the, the, the Magic approach by adding transcript quantifications um, to uh, further allow us to capture additional uh, splicing variation and uh, potentially alternate transcript start ends. Right. So. 
when we when we take the GTEx pipeline and we we apply it to um, to these five representative tissues, what we observe here is basically that um, you know leaf cutter and Majik tend to find roughly the same number of, of S genes when it comes to classical and de novo events here denoted as as S genes. Um, but you also notice that there is a very large increase in the number of SQTLs found when you look at intron retention events. And also when you look at um, isogenes or uh, isoform associated variants, uh, which potentially capture alternative transcript start ends. So the message here is that, you know, when you use this inadequate uh, splicing phenotype, it actually omits roughly a, a quarter to half of the genetically controlled splicing uh, variation, right? So the second key takeaway from this, this, this GTEx case study is that when it comes to missing values, um, the way missing values should be handled in an EQTL study and an SQTL study are fundamentally different. So when we, we don't observe gene expression, the value that we observe is zero. But when, when we observe a zero in splicing data, this actually represents the use of an alternate junction, right? So um, in, in, in the EQTL field, people will just use mean imputation to, to, to impute missing values. But when it comes to SQTL analysis, there have been many recent uh, high-profile studies where they basically just discard all the data where um, that is not observed in 95% in, in of the samples. And, and what you see from this plot here is that if you, if you plot the, the, the average coverage uh, of, of splicing events against whether they're missing or not, so the missingness rate across all your samples, what you observe is that there's a, there's a direct correlation between coverage and missingness rate. And what's more important here is that um, if you look at um, where coverage tends to be, um, you know, at the at about the 95% missingness rate here, where you highlight, which I highlight in in, in red, um, that corresponds to roughly 40% of the data, right? So by removing all of this uh, data with less than 95% uh, uh, that are observed in less than 95% of the samples, what you actually end up doing is, you know, discarding 40% of your data. And we basically show that if you actually include this data, um, you can recover potentially up to 10% additional signal in these tissues uh, shown in this figure here. So the, the, the core takeaway here is that you know, inappropriate handling of missing values tends to lead to reduced power. The third thing is model misspecification. And when you apply you know, these, these, these models that were adapted from EQTL methods, they're basically just you know, linear regression models that perform some kind of transformation on the phenotype. And this phenotype transformation that's typically done in the field is, is what's called a rank inverse normal transform, which is basically when you take you know, a skew distribution like that and you, you force it into this Gaussian shape to meet the assumptions of your linear regression model. And what we observe here is that you know, this, this, this transformation doesn't actually help with anything, right? So what I'm showing here is basically on the x-axis, you see that the, the analytical p-values you would get from you know, your standard linear regression packages. And on the, the y-axis, you see um, the p-values that are obtained um, using a bootstrapping procedure, which here we can just consider the ground truth. And what you observe is that the analytical p-values tend to be significantly inflated for these um, for these very low uh, p-values, indicating that they're, the, the, the misspecified model is actually obtaining more uh, SQTL hits. And many recent studies have actually just you know, said, well, if we observe more SQTLs, that, that's better. And clearly, that doesn't seem to be a, a good way to evaluate your model if your model is misspecified. So then, you know, the main takeaway here is more is not necessarily better. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the, the final lesson to take away here is that uh, the EQTL methods tend to search uh, SNPs around a, a one megabase window around a genes transcription start site. And when it comes to splicing, uh, what, we, what we observe here is that most SQTLs are actually within a very small uh, window around uh, splice sites, roughly 20,000 base pairs. And when you actually reduce the search size, in other words, you, you, you use a much smaller window compared to this one megabase up to 0.1 megabase, uh, you actually observe that there's a significant amount of signal that you recover here. So you actually find more signal by searching closer to splice sites. Okay, so now that we've sort of established, you know, what is wrong with the, the, the existing models, we sort of sought out to uh, in, improve upon um, the, the, the GTEx pipeline by developing our own. And I sort of show here, you know, we, we think about 
various input representations. We come up with new statistical approaches to better model splicing data. Uh, we come up with new ways to account for multiple hypothesis testing, especially across you know, very highly correlated splicing phenotypes. And we provide a whole bunch of downstream analysis tools that enable uh, users to, to perform uh, you know, biological analysis with the outputs. Um, so you know, we had a very nice, productive uh, discussion at, at the poster session yesterday regarding this. But for, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to highlight some very key uh, results from this pipeline. So. Uh, we can first start with a model, I suppose. So um, our model basically assumes that for you know a sample i, there's a there's a splice junction j, and the the quantity y represents the um, junction spanning reads that are mapped to say this blue junction here, and the n represents the total number of reads that are mapped to the splicing event. Um, we can then uh, model this as a beta binomial distribution where the mean is some function of the genotype x. Right, and although I don't show it here, we implement a whole bunch of very fast and efficient matrix operations under the hood to enable this method to scale to um, these very large consortia-level data sets. And for a single GTEx tissue, we can perform a genome-wide scan with this approach in under 24 hours. Um, the p-value here can also be computed analytically using uh, Wald's method, uh, which is a normal distribution under the null. And we also implement some additional measures to uh, correct for heteroscedasticity using sandwich estimator method. So when, then we extensively test um, on simulated data the effectiveness of, of, of this model. Um, so what I'm showing here is basically um, on the y-axis, the, the ratio of power of our model compared to two baseline approaches, which is the Gauss standard you know, Gauss linear regression and the linear regression with a RIN transformed phenotype which is what um, GTEx uses in, in their pipeline. And basically what you observe here is that, you know, okay, so first of all, a score that is a greater than one, so above the blue line means that our model is performing better. And we, 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 we perform these simulations across 32 different parametric combinations here, representing a whole bunch of different realistic conditions like uh, you know, rare, rare variance based on minor allele frequency, the skewness of the distribution, uh, variance or dispersion, the, the, the various levels of coverage uh, that the genes may have, and also whether the SQTL is also an EQTL. Um, and what you basically notice here, so the main takeaway here, is that if you look at all the cases where our model is performing better, um, what you notice is that all of these circumstances have to do with low coverage observations, um, and they also have to do with highly skewed data. And these represent scenarios that potentially deviate the most from you know, the Gaussian assumptions of, of the standard linear regression. So yeah, our model is basically more empowered to discover uh, SQTLs at low coverage and when, when size highly skewed. Then of course, you know, having high power for a model is nice, but we also need to make sure that our false positive rates are controlled under the null. So then when we do null simulations, and show that the false positive rate here is controlled at a 0.5% nominal rate. So the way this plot is read is basically, if the, if the bar touches the green line there, that means the model is performing optimally, right? So what you basically notice here is that in a substantial number of cases for these other two approaches, the false positive rate is in fact not controlled, um, particularly at lower minor allele frequencies. Um, but our model in, in the blue basically controls at that nominal rate at, at, in every possible circumstance, right? So our, our model controls false positives under the null. And one key result here that I want to highlight is that when we look at the disagree, look at the disagreement between our model and the, um, the, G, the GTEx model, uh, here showing the distribution of p-value disagreements. So uh, on, on the right side, where it says high disagreement, that's where the models disagree the most. And uh, on the, on the left side, that's where the models disagree the least. Um, if you sort of look at the splicing events that disagree the most and disagree the least, right, between these two models, uh, and you plot coverage here on the x-axis against the psi value on the y-axis, uh, what you observe is that where the models disagree the most tends to happen, uh, you know, where the coverage is quite low, below 50 reads, and the data is skewed towards 0, 1, which is a very common uh, distribution that you observe in, in splicing data. But then when you look at where the models disagree the least, they actually you know, more or less mimic the, the, the Gaussian assumptions where 
you have very high coverage. So the data is more continuous rather than discrete. And then you also have uh, values that tend to cluster around like the intermediate values. So that tends to produce, you know, the more Gaussian like distribution. Um, and to sort of make this a little bit more concrete, we can then look at you know, some, some, some key examples here. So this is an example of a SQTL. On the x-axis, you see the genotype. On the y-axis, you see psi. And the GTEx model isn't able to find this specific SQTL, uh, mostly because you see those two outliers down by, by the two. And uh, our model is able to find that because you notice that those two points, those two outlier points are actually very low coverage, right? So, Effectively, you know, if you're trying to interpret the model here, it's basically saying that um, the model isn't actually able to, or should, that the model is basically downweighing those points that have low coverage and only accounting for the points that have high coverage, right? So now we can sort of move on from the statistical modeling of detection to looking at um, the problem of uh, multiple hypothesis testing. So the model is going to output many hundreds and thousands, uh, hundreds and millions of tests. And in order to aggregate all of those tests in a meaningful way, we have to correct for multiple hypothesis testing, right? So uh, for every gene that you, that you see here, you know, we have a whole bunch of SNPs in a window around the gene that we want to test. And all of these SNPs are highly correlated based on their linkage disequilibrium structure. But with splicing data, you know, this also introduces another layer of correlation or you have correlation across the junctions as well. So for, for K SNPs in a window and J junctions, uh, you have to do J by K pairwise comparisons. And this produces an output matrix where you have um, basically J by K uh, test coefficients. And the order statistic of this, of, of this matrix is distributed with some distribution S, which we don't know, right? So we can't compute S analytically but we are actually able to sample from S. So if we treat S, if we model S as a, a matrix normal distribution with mean zero and uh, uh, the, 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 the covariances estimated from, from the SNPs and the junctions, we can then sample from this null distribution and um, empirically compute the p-values. So we can compare that against sort of what we consider, consider the gold standard right now, which is the permutation approach that's used by the GTEx model. And from what you see here is basically if you use a, you know, a misspecified model on the, on the left, the p-values between GTEx and our approach doesn't really agree. But then when you use the correctly specified model, uh, you see that there's a, a nice agreement between our resampling approach and, and the permutation that GTEx uses. But our approach is you know, many orders of magnitude faster. Um, and this is especially important for splicing data because uh, the permutations are prohibitively slow when your genes have you know, many uh, hundreds of junctions. Okay, so finally, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of just say a few brief words about the analysis pipeline. Um, we've provided, we've developed a whole bunch of uh, new visualization software, which is integrated into the, the popular Magic package, and this is done in collaboration with my colleague San Juo. And we've also um, looked at some applications to to Alzheimer's disease using our pipeline to to find potential novel variants there. And one of the more important findings we've we've come across is like this one variant in, in the Cas4 gene which is associated with Intron is not picked up by GTEx, um, primarily because it's such a low coverage gene. Um, it's, it's very lowly expressed. And Intron retention is, of course, not looked at by, by, by the GTEx consortium. So sort of in summary, you know, we have four key takeaway lessons here from this GTEx case study. You need to improve your input representation. You need to count for the missing values. Model misspecification is really important. More SQTLs found is not necessarily better. And searching in the right place is also quite important, right? So all of these um, lessons from this case study then lead us to develop new methods, which um, you know, take the form of in improved input representation, coverage-aware models that are more powerful, um, output that handles multivariate hypothesis, uh, multiple hypothesis testing correction, and then finally, um, you know, analysis and downstream visualization tools. Um, some future directions we're thinking about here. Uh, multivariate Bayesian fine mapping, work in progress, and improving the GTEx um, catalog by using our approach to potentially find uh, more um, true positive SQTLs. So with that, you know, I'd like to just uh, thank our lab and collaborators and funding, and I'll be happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. So, questions? So I would have, yeah.
Um, your your more first model, do you have? Uh, can you control for covariates? I, I didn't get yeah, if you have um, that. So the, the covariates can actually be handled in two ways. One one approach is basically you append covariates co covariates to your design matrix, and then you just perform the optimization directly on. Um, say um, what your phenotype and the, the design matrix containing the covariates. The other approach is that, which is actually what we use, is to uh, regress out the covariates prior to the analysis, and this enables the the model to run faster. So we on your counts, sorry, With, on the on the count data, you regress out. Yes. So basically, we have another model in our lab that we called Moccasin, which is developed for uh, correcting for batch and other unknown confounders directly on count data. So by adjusting the counts. Uh, in a way that regresses out the, um, the the covariates, we're able to uh, account for that in, in that way. Yeah. Okay, I'll be careful.